Thank you. Awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Billy. And um, what Don and I are going to do in the next uh, 20 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about some opportunities for uh, conducting research on engagement in the context of intensive long tool data collection and uh, in mobile health more broadly. More specifically, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, why we should care about engagement in the context of health behavior, health behavior change. And we're going to talk a little bit about what is engagement, how can we define engagement, and how can we measure and operationalize engagement. And more specifically, we're going to talk about why we think it's important that we measure engagement as a comprehensive construct, and not just in terms of its behavioral dimension, and I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by that. And then Donna will take over, and she's going to talk about some opportunities for conducting research on engagement in the context of the Intensive Longitudinal Health Behavior Network. She'll review the seven studies, the seven U1 projects that are part of the network, and she'll talk about some or brainstorm about some ideas that we have about using the data to gain better understanding of this concept of engagement. So um, why should we care about engagement? There are many reasons we should care about engagement. These are a few obvious examples. We should care about engagement if we want to adopt an exercise routine, but something always gets in the way. And we should care about engagement if we're trying to get patients to attend therapy sessions, but they often fail to show up. We should care about engagement if we develop this amazing mobile app that is supposed to help people lose weight. People download the app, but they never use it. It happens quite often. And we should also care about engagement if we're trying to get patients to give us intensive internal data for study purposes or for intervention purposes. So for study purposes, we might be interested in getting intensive long-term data because we want to better understand rapidly changing mechanisms, right? Like behaviors and experiences, like stress, cravings, suicidal thoughts. For intervention purposes, we might be interested in collecting intensive long-term data because we want to intervene on rapidly changing mechanisms. We want to intervene in a just-in-time manner. For example, we want to know if the person experiences stress so we can provide the right intervention at the right time, right? Now, this is important because many people think that we can solve the problems of engagement in intensive internal data by, simply by paying participants. And we can obviously do that, but it can also backfire, right? It can undermine people's intrinsic motivation, which is critical for behavior change, but also it reduces the scalability of the interventions that we develop. Now, think about it. If we have to pay people a lot of money to give us the data that we need in order to decide how to intervene, that means that when we roll out the intervention in the real world, we need to include these incentives. Otherwise, we're not going to have the data that we need in order to decide how to intervene, right? And that means the interventions that we develop are relatively more expensive and hence less scalable. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that incentives will not solve all our problems. So there are many reasons to consider and to care about engagement, and if that, the, these examples are not enough, we have collected a few quotes from the literature just to reinforce this point. Uh, look at the first one. Um, for therapy sessions, an engagement is considered a critical foundation. In the context of health intervention, it is considered a precondition for effectiveness. In the context of digital health behavior change interventions, evaluating engagement is a priority. So obviously there's increased um, enthusiasm about the concept of engagement, but with this increased enthusiasm, there's also increased awareness and appreciation of the complexity of this construct, and engagement is a complex construct. You see this when you try and look for a definition of engagement. Then you realize that engagement is defined differently in different fields. And actually, even within the same field, sometimes it's defined differently. Um, working as part of a multidisciplinary team of researchers at the Business School at the University of Michigan, we're trying to come up with a definition of engagement that crosses disciplinary boundaries. This is what we, ha we have so far. It's a draft definition. We might change it. So right now, we define engagement as a dynamic state of interest and energy directed toward a focal task or stimulus. Now, there are many useful definitions of engagement out there. The reason I like this one is because it helped me differentiate between two concepts that are often being conflated in the literature, engagement and motivation. So when I look at the definition, it's clear to me that motivation is the underlying source of your energy and interest, right? It's what, what's driving you, what's making you move, the answer to the question why you do what you do. 
whereas engagement is the actual manifestation of your interest and energy. And I want you to notice that I said actual manifestation and not visible manifestation. Although, so um, in this paper, Skinner and Pitzer, this is a highly cited paper in education on student engagement. They define engagement as a visible manifestation of energy and interest, and I disagree with them about the visible aspect. And the reason I disagree with them is because one thing that is also common across many definitions of engagement is this idea that engagement is not only behavioral, right? Engagement is beyond what is visible, the behavioral aspect of it. It's also cognitive and affective. So by behavioral engagement, we obviously mean do you perform the task, right? Do you attend therapy session? Do you go for a walk? Do you use the mobile app? By cognitive, we mean do you think about the task? Do you engage in cognitive processing related to the task, right? And by affective, we mean do you like it? Do you enjoy it? Do you feel committed? or attached to the task. These are three different things. They might be related, but these are three different things. In the context of health behavior change interventions, research, and also mobile health, engagement is mainly being evaluated in terms of its behavioral dimension. And very limited research attention was given to measuring engagement as a comprehensive construct. In other fields, on the other hand, for example, in education, um, industrial and organizational psychology, but also a little bit in marketing, they're doing a lot of work trying to differentiate different dimensions of engagement. This is an example from a manuscript in education that focuses on developing a measurement of student engagement. And you can see that they're focusing not only on the behavioral aspect of engagement, they also want to measure the academic aspects of it, the cognitive, the psychological, the affective. Right? The reason they're interested in this is because they think that different dimensions of engagement can be predicted by different things, and they can also lead to different outcomes. So we think that for our field, that might be a model that, may, that we might want to adopt, right? to be able to also come up or develop comprehensive models of engagement that reflect these different dimensions and not just the behavioral one. But this brings me to a more practical question. Why is it so important that we measure engagement beyond its behavioral dimension? And I think that the answer is that if we measure engagement only as behavioral, it might lead us to uh, incorrect conclusions about whether or not people are engaged. And I want to show you two examples from two studies. The first one is SARA. So SARA stands for Substance Abuse Research Assistant. It's the name of the study, but also the name of the app. So Mash Robbie from Harvard, where's Mash? Mash, you're here? Hello, Mash. So Mash has been doing an amazing work leading this project together with Maureen Walton at the University of Michigan, and many amazing people are involved in this research. Um, so this research is, is all about, this mobile app is all about trying to engage young adults in self-reporting experiences relating to substance use on a daily basis, over 30 days. That's what they're trying to do. Now, the interesting thing about this project is that the app is trying to engage these young adults in self-reporting by providing incentives that are non-monetary, right? If we have more time, I'll tell you more about this, but that's not the point. The point is, <clears throat> that when we look at the data over 30 days, we realize that participants on average completed 60% of the daily surveys. 60% is really nice considering the fact that they received very minimal monetary incentives. But the question that I have here is, does the fact that the person did not complete the survey on a given day, does the fact that the person did not engage behaviorally, does it really mean that the participant is not engaged? And I think that here the answer is not necessarily, and I want to show you why. This is an example from data uh, from a single participant. And what you see here is the, on the left there is the day of the study, 1 through 30. And then on the right there is an indicator for whether or not the participant completed the survey on a given day. Now when I first look at the data, my first impression was, this person stopped being engaged on day 21. Do you see that? Because starting on day 21, there are zeros. The person did not complete. 
but then when we looked at other source of, uh, sources of information and data about this participant, we realized that on day, that on day 23 and 24, that participant contacted Steady staff to let them know that he has a problem working with the app and that he wanted help with this problem so he'll be able to continue completing self-reporting and participating. So as soon as I realized that, I also realized that I feel very uncomfortable saying that this participant on day 23 and 24 was disengaged. Because this person was behaviorally not engaged, he did not complete the survey, but he was effectively engaged. He was committed enough up to a point that he was willing to make an effort to contact study staff to let them know that he has a problem and ask him for help. So that's one example. Another example is Sense to Stop. Again, it's the name of a study and also the name of the app. Sense to Stop is a smoking cessation app. It's supposed to provide smoking cessation support. Bonnie Spring and Santosh Kumar are leading the work on this project. Sense to Stop is trying to help smokers attempting to quit by including a collection of self-regulatory activities on the phone. These self-regulatory activities, they can use it at any time. They're supposed to help them manage craving and stress, which are predictors of a lapse, right? And in addition to that, the app from time to time reminds participants to access these apps, these self-regulatory activities. And this is a 10-day study. Now, when we look at the data, what we see is that participants over 10 days access the app about twice a day, which is really nice. But again, the question that I have here is does the fact that the person did not access the app really means that the participant is not engaged? The fact that the participant did not engage behaviorally, does it really mean that he's not engaged? And again, the answer here I think is not necessarily because one thing that I didn't tell you about the apps on the phone is that some of them are relatively brief and can be learned pretty easily. For example, this is a cognitive diffusion exercise. It's supposed to help the participant create distance between himself and negative thoughts and emotions by imagining negative thoughts and emotions as a concrete object on a table. And the app is guiding the participant through a series of questions where he needs to describe what this object looks like. Now, participants can do this exercise once, and once or twice, and then they know how to go about it. They don't have to access the app in order to use it, right? So here, if you only look at app access as an indicator of engagement, you might get an incorrect answer to the question whether or not the person is engaged. Because the person might not be engaged behaviorally by accessing the app, but he might be engaged cognitively with the self-regulatory activity. All right, so this is why we think that it's really important that we not only focus on behavioral aspects of engagement, but also cognitive and effective. And next, Donna is going to take over and she's gonna tell you about some opportunities on doing research on engagement as a comprehensive construct. That is my friend, Billy. Yes, it's the same set of slides. So, really well done. Um, so, thanks. What we don't know. Um, which dimensions of engagement are important in achieving a specific ultimate outcome? So, how much engagement do I need in my exercise app for it to work? I think that's gonna differ across outcomes, across different populations, um, surely it will differ over time how much you need to be involved and how much you need to access the app or how many times you need to go to therapy. And it will differ um, across different outcomes. I already said that, yes. The measurement of behavioral domains, which is the one that we've got, we know the most about, it's still a work in progress. I mean, we can know what's going on in the back end of the app, but st how to use that data, we're still working on it. I think Stephen will address that in a bit. Um, how to measure cognitive and effective aspects or engagement. These are new areas that are really just coming to the fore, in particular the effective area. Um, we also don't know how engagement fluctuates over time, and we need to know, we need to know that, and we also need to know when and how to re-engage people if we lose them. So if you're in the middle of an intervention or a therapy session or whatever, and um, you, you, engagement 
drops off. Is that a bad thing? I mean, if somebody is using my exercise app, you might know by now that I'm an obesity researcher. <laughs> it shows. Um, if somebody is using my exercise app and they are reaching their exercise goals, say stop using the app, do I need to ping them? No. When do I, do need, when do I need to ping them? We don't, we don't know any of this. Um, so here is our network opportunity. Um, it's seven projects, as Dana said, and one of the goals of the network is to provide a framework to guide future intensive longitudinal studies of health behavior. Um, and here are the different behaviors Dana already walked you through, so let me show you once more a bit of a map of these studies. Does this have a pointer? Ooh, I can point. Um, so it's interesting to see that some of them are observational and two of them are micro-randomized trials. A micro-randomized trial, very briefly, is when every, let's say ours is a micro-randomized trial and we are going to give you, you, you have five opportunities per day to get an exercise intervention. At every one of those five decision points, you're re-randomized to either get it or not. And it's weighted. So it's a really great way of finding out what works when for whom. Um, to tell you what is an intense, intensive longitudinal data, I think many of you know, but a few of you might not. But if you take a look at this, so some of these studies, our study is for a year. So other studies are for a year. This is six months, six EMAs a day for the last, for, and, for, and then for the last three months, one EMA a day, plus a lot of sensing data. So this gathers a lot of data over a long period of time. So you understand that we need people to stay in the game with us. And how to keep people engaged is kind of a, a new science for us at least. So here are some of the behavioral measures of EMA that we could talk about. So ecological momentary assessment, getting questions on your phone. Um, we could just find out if people complete it or not whenever they're given an EMA. Um, how long did it take them to complete it? Response latency. How long did it take them to complete the whole survey? Um, in the engagement with apps, for, um, for instance, how the amount or the amount of time or the number of instances that you've opened the app is a measure of behavioral engagement. Um, engagement with the device. Did you use your phone? Is your phone charged? Did you, so a lot of us are using smart watches. Is the, did you charge your watch? Are you wearing the watch? Are you interacting with the watch? These are all measures of behavioral engagement. But like Billy was saying, they really don't tell the whole story. So here's some possible measures of cognitive engagement. Um, Self-reported burden, self-reported perception of interruption, um, and different reactions to prompts, questions, intervention components. A lot of this can be done with qualitative data to try and figure out what floats people's boats for which people, one of the which times. You know, it's gonna work differently over time for different people. When we get into the effective measurements of engagement, we, are, we have no ground truth for this. This is really a new area. So some of the things that we can think of right now are self-reported satisfaction or enjoyment of the, of the app or of the, of the intervention, um, self-reported tiredness, fatigue, burnout. People do really burn out. I'm sure you've all seen those graphs. I, I got my Fitbit. I used my Fitbit. My Fitbit's in the drawer, and this, is, this happens a lot with technology. And how do we overcome that? Um, another thing to keep track of when you're with these new studies is contact, as, as Billy was saying, how often were the, were the study personnel contacted? That's, that shows some kind of effective engagement. So you get an idea of the enormous amount of data that we're going to be getting in these seven projects, I hope. I, we are all hoping that we aren't going to blow up the internet with all this data. <laughs> and so what are we planning to do with it besides blow up the internet? No, not really. <laughs> um, so what we, we want to do is use some harmonization. In other words, study, we're, like across all studies, we're probably using about the same um, um, items for affect to measure affect not at the same time and not at the same frequency, but at least we'll be able to look across studies to see how that fluctuates over time and how that changes in different circumstances. Um, 
And most importantly, we want to be able to develop dynamic models that will inform new dynamic theories of behavior because really your behavior is dynamic and all of our theories are quite static, developed often using one-shot questionnaires and in which A, right, I've got to work this way, right? In which A leads to B leads to behavior and that's not how my behavior works. I don't know about you. My behavior is loopy and it changes over time and you know, in the morning, I might be perfectly happy to go for a run, but really at 4 o'clock, I'm waiting until 5 when I can have a drink. <laughs> yes. Um, so what we want to understand is how best to measure behavioral, cognitive, and affective engagement. What are the best indicators? How does engagement vary over time across different circumstances within different people? What are the predictors of engagement? At baseline, for instance, we really do think personality has a good shot. Different personalities tend to engage differently with technology. Um, different incentive systems are gonna matter. Um, we also think that predictors of, and there might be time varying predictors of engagement. For instance, location, who I'm with, prior engagement, habit. Um, what's the impact of, of participant burden? i.e. what we call participant burden, which is frequency, timing, and type of data collected. A lot of, um, a lot of the frequency, timing, and type of data that we collect is sort of the way that we do it as researchers is based on implicit maps of how this works and not necessarily on data. So it's not, it's not necessarily true, for instance, I work with kids, that more questions equals burden. Sometimes stup very few stupid questions is much more of a burden than asking them something that really matters to them. So how do we find, you know, but this is still my implicit theory. It's time to sort of iron this stuff out among different populations. Um, yeah, what aspects of engagement predict, predict the ultimate outcome in each of the studies? So engagement for psychology or for a physical activity study might be different than engagement for a mental health study. Um, and all of these are going to vary and interact across the different um, areas of research. So opportunities and the next steps, how am I doing? I'm good? Okay. Um, we are going to be able to do more descriptive work to clearly elucidate the processes that influence changes in, in engagement. And we really want to develop dynamic, personalized models of the engagement process. So instead of starting with a population level model, we want to model per individual and work our way up. So it's a whole different way of thinking about modeling because we are going to have that data now. We're going to be able to model NS1 and then think about group. And it's going to be dynamic, so things are going to change over time. Um, and then, of course, we want, to we want to investigate how best to intervene to promote engagement and, to, of course, to support the, uh, the, out the ultimate outcomes, as Billy calls them. Um, so when is the best time to intervene? When is a person vulnerable or open to an intervention? What, what determines that for which people, for which kind of intervention? So that we want, by saying that we're going to intervene just in time and adaptively, it means we're going to intervene when you need it. So if I'm fighting with my boss, at that moment is not the right moment to give me an anger management intervention. You are too, too late. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's best to give me an intervention when you know I'm getting angry. Maybe that's the worst time. Maybe I'm gonna be resistant then. Maybe you should give me one when I'm calm. You know, when you get angry next time, visualize that thing on the table. You know, we, we don't know what's the right intervention or when's the best time to do it, but just in time is when you need it, where you need it, and when you're available to listen. And adaptive means I'm not going to give you the same intervention all the time. I mean, once you've gotten a certain message X amount of times, we're going to lose you. So we need to change our interventions as your behavior changes, right? Um, so these are a couple of designs. How many of you have heard of the SMART trials? I know you guys have, yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah, she Googled it last night, yeah. Well, Billy Nahum Shani invented the whole thing. <laughs> together with a bunch of other people, but you really had a hand in it. Susan Murphy, too. So a SMART trial is a sequential, multiple assignment, randomized trial, which means 
that you start out in a, a particular intervention, and let's say for weight loss, sorry, that's my area of expertise. If you haven't lost weight in, is it 11 or 14 days? How many days, Billy, 11 or 14, do you remember? 14. So if you haven't lost weight in 14 days, the, this is not the treatment for you. We now know this. 14 days is like magic. So what a smart trial does then is that it ups your intervention. If you're not doing well, gives you something more. And if you've lost some weight, then this intervention is working and it stays that way. How am I doing? Yeah? All right. That's a smart, right? And a micro-randomized trial I already explained a little bit of where you just keep randomizing whether or not I get an intervention, which tells you, which you can also see if this particular intervention conglomerate works, but it also tells you what works when for whom over time. So um, these are two really important research designs that we can um, employ to further interventions in real time. And we hope we're gonna figure out how to keep people in the game, engaged. Thank you all for listening. It takes a friggin' village, pardon my language. And um, as Wendy said, <laughs> there's, um, th these people are from all walks of life. And so thank you very much for listening to me. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen and Tilly.